And he went to visit Elisha ben Avuya, and he saw that he was deteriorating. So the mayor turned to Elisha ben Avuya and said, Are you thinking about doing tshuva? Which, think about it, it's a courageous thing to say. He wasn't a 14 year old kid, he was the greatest sage who abandoned everybody. And this is what he told them. So Elisha ben Avuya says to Reb Meir, and if I do tshuva, you think I'll be accepted? So Reb Meir said, it says in Tehillim, Toshev Enosh Ad Daka, which means let a human being return Ad Daka. What's Ad Daka? Ad Dichducha Shal Nefesh. Until the last vestige of life in the soul, until the soul expires, Toshev Enosh, come back. Elisha started to sob, the Gemara says, Venifter, and he passed away. Reb Meir was overjoyed and he said these words, Doime shemitoich tshuva niftar rabbi. It seems to me that my Rebbe passed away with tshuva. The yeshiva.net. So today's class is dedicated in memory of Rivka Bas Shmuel, honor of her yard site on the 10th day of Eir, Yud Eir dedicated by her loving grandson, Rabbi Yitzchak Shlomo. Also dedicated by Rabbi Yitzchak Shlomo, Lariches Yom and Vashanam Toivus, in tribute to his wife, and Eishas Chayel, Rachel Sara, Bas Naomi, for all the bracha of Hatzlacha, Ad Bli Dai. Thank you very, very much. Also dedicated anonymously, as a schus for a shidduch, for myself, the person writes, my siblings, and for everyone, who is searching for their bashert. Amen. Easy, smooth, and bekarev. And abinyan adayat. Thank you very, very much. This week, we're going to explore together, Be'ezer Hashem, a fascinating Mishnah in Pirkei Yavis, chapter 4. The fourth chapter of the Ethics of the Fathers. As we discussed in previous classes, the Shabbosim after Pesach, when spring and summer arrive, the Jewish custom is to learn each Shabbos, the chapters, the ethics of the fathers. This Shabbos would be chapter 4, Perek Dalet. So I chose one Mishnah in Perek Dalet, Mishnah Chaf, the 20th Mishnah of chapter 4. Please uh, take a look at your source sheets, the first source. Elisha ben Avoya, you have on the right in Hebrew and on the left in English. Elisha ben Avoya Oimer. Elisha, the son of Avoya, says, Translation. Elisha, the son of Avoya, would say, one who learns Torah as a yeled, as a child in childhood, then what is it comparable to, to ink inscribed on fresh paper? But one who only learns Torah as zakin in their old age, what is it comparable to? To ink inscribed on erased paper. This is what Elisha ben Avoy is teaching us. It's an entire different quality of studying, learning, integrating, internalizing, understanding, perceiving. When one is in their young years, one is a youth, one is a child, and when one grows older. You have the ink, the way it's absorbed into fresh paper, and the way the ink becomes connected to paper that was used and used again, and maybe even used again and again, and everything was erased, and you're writing, you're putting the ink on the words and letters that were already erased maybe once or maybe numerous times. Then the Mishnah continues. Rabbi Yoisi bar Yehuda Ishkvar Habavli Yoimer. One of the sages was named Rabbi Yoisi, the son of Yehuda. He was known as Ish, a person, the person of Kfar Habavli, a village known as the village of Bavli. He said this, one who learns Torah from youngsters, whom is he comparable to? To one who eats unripe grapes and drinks unfermented wine from the press. 
the wine that still had a lot of haven mixed into it, a lot of sediments mixed into it. One who learns Torah from older sages, whom is he comparable to? One who eats ripened grapes and drinks aged wine, wine that has been fermented and is clear and pure, aged wine that is beautiful and pure without any of the shmarim, the sediments mixed into it. So the first clause of the Mishnah by Elisha ben Avoy is talking about the person who's learning. There's a difference if I'm learning when I'm a child or I'm absorbing information and internalizing knowledge and guidance when I am much older. The second clause, the second stanza of the Mishnah is talking about the student who wants to learn from somebody. So he says, I could learn from a youngster and that means the grape may not be ripe. A person who's young still may not have the experience doesn't have the experience of life, the maturity, as they say in English, hasn't been around the block, maybe once, maybe not even once. So the grapes are not yet ripe with life experience. They're not yet fully developed and mature. The wine that I drink is fresh wine, but it still didn't sit and ferment, which is basically compared to life experience, where somebody who learns Torah from an older person with a lot more maturity and wisdom and experience and somebody who is seeing a lot and who has learned so much more, etc. This is somebody who's eating ripe grapes and drinking aged wine. And then the Mishnah concludes a third clause, a third stanza. Rabbi Oimer, Rabbi says, Rabbi is Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, Rabbi Judah the Prince, the editor actually of the Mishnah. And the Arizal's version is Rabbi Meir Oimer, Reb Meir says, and that's also the version in the Siddur of the Balatanya, he quotes Reb Meir says, and in other versions, other texts of the Mishnah, it's Reb Meir. Al tistakel bekankan ela bamesha yeshboi. This has become already a very famous saying, even in various languages. Look not at the vessel, but only at what it contains. Or as they say in English, don't judge a book by its cover. Don't judge a bottle by what the bottle looks like. The kankan is the container, the, the flax, the ba- bottle. Yesh kankan chadosh mala yashon. V'yashon shafilu chadosh ein poi. Because looks can be deceiving. You can have a new vessel, but it's filled with old, aged, delicious, fragrant, extraordinary wine that the connoisseurs are writing insane reviews about. You can have an old vessel that doesn't even contain new wine, or as your Baba would say, Sitoigav Kaparis. It's an old vessel. It looks like, I don't know, maybe it's a wine 200 years old and not from Scotland or from France, it's from Louis XIV's palace. But when you open it up, Bopkis, there's nothing there. <clears throat> Somebody once said with Yichis, Yichis is like a potato. The best part of it is in the air. <coughs> So uh, this is what the mayor says. Don't look at the kankan. Don't look at the outer container. What's inside? Now, it's a very interesting Mishnah. Three different teachings by Elisha ben Avuya, Rabbi Yossi bar Yehuda Yishkvar Abavli, and Rabbi or Reb Meir. When we think about it, however, there are a few questions that come up. Let's go in the order. The first statement of Elisha ben Avuya, what is he trying to teach us? Pirkei Yavis is not just a compilation of things that people said. It's said by the Tanoim, by the greatest sages in Jewish history, to teach us ethics, to teach us guidance. And as I said last week, the Gemara says, in Baba Kama Daf Lama, that Pirkei Yavis is dedicated to teach piety, to teach somebody who wants to go beyond the letter of the law. Basic halacha of how a Jew lives doesn't say in Pirkei Yavis not to steal or not to lie, or not to wear shatnas, or not to eat uh, non-kosher meat. For that you have the Chumash, and you have the Mishnah, and you have the Gemara. Pirkei is especially dedicated to ethics, to cultivating characteristics, and to cultivating behaviors and attitudes that are lifnimishur sadin, that are extra pious. What is Elisha ben Avoya teaching here? He's telling us the difference between learning as a child and learning as an older person. So the question is, the first question is, my Mashmala, what's the Chiddush? Everybody knows, even without Elisha ben Avuya, that children absorb information much better and much faster than adults. 
even teenagers and young adults can't absorb like children absorb. Certainly once we get older, it's a whole different, it's a whole different experience. Teach new languages, right? Teach new, what do they say? You can't teach uh, an old whatever, uh, right? New tricks. Teach la- children here new languages, right? Sometimes they absorb it with, with extraordinary swiftness. When I'm older and I want to learn a new language, it's very, very difficult. And same is with all other information. So it's an obvious thing. It's fresh. He's a child or she's a child. What's the Kiddush? What's Elisha ben Avuya telling us? This is a fact that everybody knows. So you'll say, he's trying to guide us about how important it is to teach them when they're young. <laughs> to inculcate, to bequeath wisdom, knowledge, spirituality, values, experience, Torah, Yer Shemayim, Avos Hashem, Avos Yisrael, to children. Don't wait till a person grows up, until the person becomes old. Don't say he or she is only a child. On the contrary, that's when it's going to be absorbed because the paper is fresh. The brain is absolutely open. That's valuable, valuable guidance. It's like the old Chelem joke. You know the old joke? There was a Jew. They say a Jew from Chelem. And he wanted to go check out the big city. So he decided to take a trek, a hike from Chelem, which is in Poland, to Warsaw. As he's walking in Chelem, they didn't know about trains, they didn't know about railways, they didn't know about tracks. It was unheard of in Chelem. They knew about a horse and a buggy. Uh, and if you were wet, wealthy, you had a white horse and a young horse and a strong her- horse. So this man is walking, and it was winter time. So the roads that were unpaved in Poland were muddy and very difficult to walk on. And then suddenly he sees metal on the ground, and he says, Ah, Machaya. He's going to walk on the metal, what we would call tracks, in order to protect his feet, to protect his pants, to protect his body. So he's walking calmly and nicely, enjoying his long hike to Warsaw from Chelem. Suddenly, he hears a little squeaky voice behind him. He turns around and he sees this little creature, which he didn't know how to identify, moving. And he thought, well, that's interesting what type of animal is also using the same tracks the same path and he continues as he continues the the sound becomes louder and more ferocious and it's creating a larger ruckus and he turns around and the squeaking is larger is louder and the creature suddenly has grown interesting he never saw this in his life he continues and suddenly before he knows it does he hear a screech and he can't even turn around. The pressure and the wind throws him off, literally lifts him up in the air. He ends up in a ditch. The poor man is maimed and wounded. Fabluktikt, fakvetcht, fahakt, fawundet. He's wounded, nebach. <laughs> and he's sighing and crying for help. Another Jew is walking on the road and he sees this yid nebach in a ditch. So he runs over, lifts him up, says, Come, I live nearby, let me help you. Brings him to his house bandages the wounds, sits him down, relax, and then says, it looks like you can use a hot cup of tea to be mechaya nefeshu, to give you a bisalebna, live life, let me put on the kettle. So he fills up the kettle with water, he puts it on the fire, puts on the stove, and the kettle begins after a few minutes to emit a little squeak. This Jew, this Jew, who was today we would call it a little, has a little PTSD or a lot of PTSD, runs over, sees a bat or a huge stick, runs over to the kettle and starts beating it, beating it, beating it. It's splintered into 2,000 pieces. It's all over the guy's chicken, kitchen. He says, Reb Yid, what are you doing? Was Tustu? He says, let me tell you, these guys you have to get when they're young and small because if you wait... <laughs> They become monsters and they will destroy you. So apparently it's a good lesson. You got to get them when they're young and vulnerable and small because that's when good things, pure things can go in. That's how we would understand on a basic level the teaching of the Mishnah. But if this is the whole case, then why does he add the second part? That if you learn Torah as an old person, it's like absorbing, it's like putting ink, inscribing ink, on erased paper. 
It's obvious already. If one explains that there's a gewaldic in and learning Torah as a child because of how it's absorbed, automatically, I understand that when I'm older, the situation changes. So first of all, it seems superfluous. But much more than that, not only superfluous, disturbing. There are many people in the world and many Jews throughout history who didn't have a chance to learn Torah as children. For whatever reason. It may have been their parents' choice. It may have been not even their parents' choice. Circumstances of life. One of the greatest of the great, Elisha ben Avoya had a student and a friend, Rabbi Akiva himself, didn't learn until he was 40. Many, many people didn't learn. Today you have so many Jews who for whatever reason have no education in Judaism as children and only later as older people discover it. So what's Elisha ben Avoya telling these people? He's trying to tell them... <laughs> not going to work. It's erased paper. Nothing is going to go in. The first clause is positive. Encourage people to inspire children and teach children and saturate them with Torah and Yerushamayim in the youngest of ages. Gewaldik. What's the second clause teaching us? Besides it being superfluous, it seems so discouraging because a Jew who's older also has an obligation to learn Torah. It's not like once I hit a certain age, the obligation to learn is gone. It continues throughout life. Ki heim chayenu. As we say in Mayrim, in the evening services. So what's he telling this person? Literally uh, depleting the energy and the enthusiasm. You know what? You're an oizge klapta shaina. You're over the hill. You're an old man. You're erased paper. Nothing is going to go in. <clears throat> Number one. Number two. Who is the author of this Mishnah? Elisha ben Avuya. Elisha ben Avuya is a person who's not mentioned anywhere in Mishnayis besides in this place. And there's a reason for it. Elisha ben Avuya has become a legend in Jewish history and not for very positive reasons. He's not famous, but Elisha ben Avuya is infamous. And you have to understand the context. Elisha ben Avuya lived in the era at the end of the second Beis HaMikdash. Second Beis HaMikdash was destroyed by the Romans in the year 70 after the Common Era, and he lived through the destruction. Elisha ben Avuya was considered the greatest sage of the time, or certainly one of the greatest sages of the time, to the point that the Medrash Rabbah says in Rus, in Medrash Rabbah in Rus, which is learned on Shavuos, says that Elisha ben Avuya, when he came into the Beis HaMikdash, they said, when they closed the doors of the Azara, the yard of the Beis HaMikdash, when they closed the doors of the Azara, there was nobody who was as wise and so powerful in Torah like Elisha ben Avoya. In fact, when he would speak and teach in the Beis HaMikdash or in the Shul in Tveria, everybody would stand up, the greatest sages would stand and just listen to these man, this man's words and everybody would come at the end and kiss him on his head. Kiss him and they didn't just give him like shkoyach, shkoyach, you know, shkoyach, a cold dead yeshikoyach. They came and kissed him in his head. If this is true in Tveria, where there were so many sages, you can imagine when he spoke in other cities and when he spoke in other, in other provinces and other countries. And this man, who was the Rebbe of Reb Meir, Reb Meir, the Gemara says in Erevin, page 13, Reb Meir, the reason he was called Reb Meir is because Meir Eni Chachamim Ba'alach, he illuminated the eyes of all the sages in Allah. Not only that, the Gemara says there that the reason the halach is usually not like Reb Meir because the sages couldn't understand his depth. They didn't understand what he was saying. Who was his Rebbe? Elisha ben Avuya. He's the one who mentored Reb Meir who was considered the greatest of the great and this was his teacher, his master. And yet this man, there's more than I think a thousand names of sages that are mentioned in the Talmud, in Mishnah and Gemara, more than a thousand names. From all those, a thou, more than a thousand sages, we don't know of one who, as they say, became OTD, who left Yiddishkeit. And there's only one. And this was Elisha ben Avuya. Elisha ben Avuya completely abandoned his faith and his people. And during a very traumatic era of Jewish history, because this was the era of the destruction. And this is when he abandoned the Jewish people. And to the point that whenever they quote stories about him, they don't even call him by name. They call him by the name. You know the name they use for him? Acher. What a strange name. Acher means a stranger. 
literally a stranger, an alien, the other one, the foreigner, the acher. He's like somebody else. What, what, what's, what, give him a name. It's a very interesting name, Acher. You know how he got the name. So the Gemara says in Chagiga, page 15, of Tesvav, that after Elisha ben Avuya completely abandoned Yiddishkeit, he became also promis- prom- promiscuous. And he went to a zayna, he went to a harlot, to ask for her services. And she looked at him, and she said, You? <laughs> you got the wrong address. You're looking for the wrong. Google Maps is making jokes with you. <laughs> This is not a house for you. This is a house of ill repute, as they say. It was Shabbos. So the Gemara says, Elisha ben Avaya plucked out a grass from the ground or a branch from the tree. And he said, look. She said, ah, you must not be Elisha ben Avaya. You're Acher. You're somebody else. I'm mistaking you. You know, when people say, oh, I thought you were him. I thought you were Elisha ben Avoya. I see you're Acher. You're another one. Her name stuck. Her name stuck. I guess she publicized the story. It, was, it went out on all the WhatsApps. Mitzvah Shabbos probably pretty fast. Right? And, and, and generally, let's put it this way. Huh? Let's put it this way. This woman wasn't the greatest Sadekis of town, as you can understand. So uh, the name stuck. Acher. He's the other one. He's the alien. Which is a very interesting name. He's somebody else. He's not Elisha ben Avuya. How can it be Elisha ben Avuya on Shabbos? Committing a biblical sin because plucking kaitzer is one of the 39 malachas that are forbidden in Atayra. Harvest. Ah? Very good. <laughs> Very good. So it's not a coincidence that despite his profound wisdom, he's not mentioned even once in the whole Mishnahis. Even though all of his friends and his students and his teachers are mentioned constantly. Reb Meir and Rabbi Akiva and that whole generation, Rabbi Eleazar and Rabbi Gamliel and Rabbi Yosir, Rabbi Yehudah, Rabbi Shimon, students of Rabbi Akiva. He's not mentioned besides here. Here he's mentioned and he's mentioned with his name. Why did they decide to mention him here? And to mention him here with this name? And Elisha ben Avuya had a lot of teachings. Remember, he was considered the greatest sage, but this teaching was chosen, no other one. I should mention just for context and accuracy, in Gemara he's mentioned a few times in terms of stories about him, like the story I just told. There's also a halacha mentioned about him in Mayat Katan, Tavchaf, where Reb Tzaddik's father passed away, and Reb Tzaddik only heard about it three years later, and he came to ask Elisha ben Avuya what to do, and Elisha ben Avuya told him what to do, to sit shiva even three years later. So there the Gemara mentions a story, a, psak from my, a verdict of Elisha ben Avoyah. In Ava is the Reb Nassan. Here, there are around nine or ten teachings of Elisha ben Avoyah in Ava is the Reb Nassan, all on the theme of learning Torah, how you learn, and learning Torah as a child. But in the whole Mishnayis, it's only once, and it's in Pirkei Yavah's Perek Dalet, Mishnachaf. There has to be some significance to it. What is it? Let's go for a moment to the second clause. What was the second clause? Rabbi Yaisi Yishkvar HaBavli told us that if you're learning Torah from youngsters, it's like eating unripened grapes and drinking wine that was not fermented versus learning Torah from older sages, you're eating ripe grapes and you're drinking aged wine. Why does he give two examples of grapes and wine? One example would have been enough. When you're learning from a child, the grape is not ripe yet. It's not time to eat it. Let it stay on the tree. You know when you pluck a grape too early? It doesn't have that taste. It didn't develop. You have to know from who to learn. People need to develop. They need to be in their incubator a little longer. You can't take out the fetus before it's ready to come out. It has a lot of challenges. Sometimes it has to be done for pikuach nefesh, but it's a difficult situation. But then he gives a second metaphor from wine. Why the need for two? So the Maharal of Prague says something beautiful in his commentary on Pirkei Yav, is called Derech Chayim, and he says wine comes from the grapes. The grape is a food, it's a substance, it's a dense substance. Wine is more dark, it's edel, it's refined, it's a beverage, it's a liquid, number one. Number two, the grapes are on the outside. The wine is contained on the inside, the pnimius, and you have to crush and take the grapes to the press, to the wine press, to press and crush the grapes, and then the wine come out. Maral says the metaphor of these two things intimates and indicates two dimensions of Judaism, two dimensions of Torah. There are the grapes of Torah, 
and there's Yeno Shal the wine of Taira. Taira has two aspects. What's called in Zayar, Chitzayniyus HaTaira, and Pnimiyus HaTaira. There's the outer layer of Taira, the Zayar in Baalai Yitzchah says, Gufa Daira and Eshmasa Daira There's the body of Taira, which is the outer concrete layer of Taira, which is very concrete and material and practical and physical and dense, like a grape. And then there's the Pnimiyus HaTaira, the Neshmasa Daira like the soul which is inside the body, the core, the inner consciousness, that's the wine of Taira. One is dense and one is deals with, 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 with energy. It's more energetic, divine. It's a spiritual consciousness and experience. Rather than the technical, concrete manifestation. And both are critical and vital, like a body and a soul. They're one, Teira Achas. One is the Chitzonius and one is the Pnimius. So that's why he's talking about both. He's talking about the grapes and he's talking about the wine. Clear. But now we come to the third clause. What's the third one? Reb Meir says, don't look at the bottle. You got to look what's inside the bottle. So the Bartanura says, Reb Meir is arguing with Reb Yossi. Reb Yossi said, don't learn from youth. Learn from older people. Reb Meir said, don't look at the bottle. <laughs> look what's inside the bottle. Sometimes you can have a kankan. You can have a kankan. You can have a bottle that is new, fresh, like a child. But it's filled with good wine. It's deceiving. You look at the bottle and you think it's new wine that was just pressed. No, no, no. They used a new bottle, but they put an old wine. And sometimes you can have an old bottle, like an old man. And when you open it up, gurdisht. <laughs> There's nothing there. So Reb Meir says it's not always about age. The Bartanur says he's arguing with the second opinion. That's what he's saying. That's what Reb Meir is saying. Don't look at the outside, don't look at age. Sometimes you can have children, but they have, as they say, old souls. <laughs> you know? Some of you have children like that, right? 12-year-old going on 95. <laughs> Today they're discussing when do people become when do children become teenagers? I said it's usually between three and four. If you're lucky, maybe five and six. If your mamish have Gavaldikasyata Deshmaya, they'll give you till nine and a half. But uh, not much later. So the May says. You have sometimes old souls. They may look young, but they have a lot of wisdom. They have a lot of experience. And we know sometimes you have young people who have been through a lot. Sometimes have been through much more than others, and they have an authenticity and a depth and a maturity that sometimes older people can't even handle. Right? The last prophecy of Malachi, the last prophecy, Malachi is the last prophet of the Jewish people, Rashi says, The children sometimes help the parents either grow up or find their souls or find God. So the mayor says, don't judge the bottle. You have to know what's inside the bottle because looks and age can be very deceiving. That's how the Bartanura explains it. But here we come to a question. Whenever Torah gives a metaphor, it's because the metaphor is necessary. Especially Mishnayis. The Rambam says that in Mishnayis, every word is meticulous and precise. We give metaphors and parables and allegories and stories and anecdotes for entertainment purposes. When the Mishnah gives a metaphor, it's precise in order to help you understand it. Because without the metaphor, somehow the idea is incomprehensible. But in this case, the metaphor seems more than obvious. Everybody knows this. Let's say you have a bottle in your house. Some people have bottles of wine, right? Your husband likes wine, you like wine. Some people have whole sections in their house dedicated to wine. And they show here 500 years, 200 years, 60 years, 70 years, this wine, I only open it up, pour him once in 20 years. But what if somebody used it for Kiddush, or for Havdalah, or for a Simcha, for Lechaim, for whatever? It's an empty bottle. It's not a, it's a big Kiddush that you can have an old bottle, hundreds of years old, and a filu Yasha name boy, and a filu Chadash name boy. You used it for Kiddush, it's empty, obviously. And obviously you can have a new bottle and you poured something else into it. They say a joke, it was a Rav who invited his community for a Hanukkah party. This rabbi was known as somebody who loved antiques. And he was a collector of old Judaica. The community came. It was an opportunity to display some of his precious and priceless items. So they come to the party. 
and the set up, the balabasta set up a beautiful Hanukkah table with all the Hanukkah delicious foods. And then he turns to the congregation and he says, you see this menorah? This menorah comes from Turkey from the 1600s. You see this dreidel? This dreidel was found in the Warsaw Ghetto. You see this text of the Hanukkah brachas, the blessings, and my Soyu Shuasi? This is a handwriting from the 13th century in France. And he goes on and on about every item. One of the congregants says, and these latkes are from when? <laughs> so it's very obvious that you can have a kankan, <laughs> an old bottle with nothing in it, or a new bottle with everything in it. That's an obvious metaphor. Reb Meir is saying it because he wants to teach me something. But he could have just get straight to the point and say, it's not always about age. You can have a young person with a lot of wisdom and an older person with not so much wisdom. What is he telling us through this metaphor of the kankan? And here again, let's think about the name. Who's saying this mission? According to many versions, it's Rebbe, the last clause, and according to the Arizal's version, the Baltanya's version, and others, it's Reb Meir. And in every Mishnah, the one who says the teaching is always connected to the person. It's not a random thing. Elisha ben Avoya says this, Reb Yoisi says this, Reb Meir says this, Rebbe says this. There's a reason why this sage said this. There's always a connection between the life story, the personality, the soul, the mind, the legacy, the perspective, the Veltan Shaung of this particular sage. When Elisha ben Avuya says, there is learning Torah as a child and learning Torah as an older person. In the first, I'm inscribing ink on fresh paper. In the second, I'm inscribing ink on erased paper. He's not just talking about years. He's not just talking about biology. Age does not always follow the passport or the license plate or the license ID. Of course, a person can be young, a person can be a zakein. What Elisha ben Avuya, in addition to the literal interpretation, he's also teaching something much more profound that relates to all ages. In other words, I can be an older person and still learn Torah as a child. I can sometimes be young, but still learn Torah as a zakin, as an old man or an elder woman. What does this mean? Children by nature are open. They're fertile. They're ready to absorb. Because they're so youthful, especially at the youngest of ages, their neural pathways are just beginning to develop. There's a humility. There's curiosity, there's inquisitiveness, there's no confirmation bias. When a person gets older, my neural pathways are developed, I have my comfort zones, I have my fixed way of thinking about things and responding to life. So Elisha ben Avuya is telling us something very profound. He's not trying to discourage a person who didn't have this chuz, the privilege of learning Torah as a child and saying, oh, as you're old, nothing is going to go and you're just erased paper. You're going to have to work and work and you're still not going to be so successful. He's actually encouraging a mindset which requires often a lot of intellectual and even more emotional, psychological and spiritual work. And that is, as old as I am, make sure when you learn Torah, your paper is fresh. You're a child. No difference if I'm five or I'm 55 or even if I'm 85, or 105, Be'ezer Hashem, or 65, or whatever age I am. It could be difficult. Why? I develop survival skills. We all have to develop survival skills. Ways in which we interact with the world around us, ways in which we interact with ourselves, and these become my comfort zones. And it's not easy for me to hear something really new and revolutionary that could stir up my chalun pot. I'm not ready to stir up my pot. Been there, done there. I have found my way. Maybe I know it's a little dysfunctional. Maybe there's still some anxiety and some fear. Maybe I'm dealing with stuff, but you know what? It's the familiar life, and this is how I came to survive. And much of it may not even be conscious. It may be unconscious. So when I hear something new, what do I do? Either I fall asleep, great defense mechanism, or I dismiss it as not connected to me, it's for other people. Or I even find a reason why to say this is shallow or stupid or heresy. Right? Or, 
and this is the most common, I just fit it into already something I know. I open a filing cabinet of familiar files. I take this information and I say, oh, this fits my old way of thinking. I once told my students, male students, that one of the worst things, one of the worst compliment, one of the worst thing, when somebody comes to give me a compliment or after a class, one of the least appreciated compliments is when somebody says, what you said reminds me of the vart I heard last Shabbos. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> the guys tried to compliment, so I appreciate it. <laughs> but you understand why. <laughs> it's difficult. I understand. It's not easy to step out of my comfort zone. Do you know how many blockages I may have to really hear information? And it's not even my fault. <laughs> These are my patterns. It's very difficult once I hit a certain age to go back to those patterns, to question them. And that's the reason why children have a memory that is extraordinary. You ever noticed how your child reminds you something you said like 20 years ago when he was two years old or four years old or she was four and a half years old? You don't remember what you said yesterday. But mommy, you said, uh, how do they remember everything? How do they remember everything? The answer is because they know how to listen. For adults, it's very difficult to listen. When we hear things, you'll forgive me, hopefully present company excluded, but I speak to many audiences. When we listen, think about this, we usually don't listen. We form opinions. Isn't it true? We sometimes sit in a class and we say, that's good. He's talking just to me. How does he know this? That's interesting. I wish my husband was here. I have to hear it. My husband has to hear it. My mother-in-law has to hear it. Why? Well, my mother has to hear this. <laughs> I don't listen. I have opinions. This is good. This is not so good. You know what? This I'm going to use. Shabbos. I needed a word for Shabbos. I'm going to use it. In other words, what am I thinking about? I'm not thinking about what you're saying. I'm thinking about the way I'm processing what you're saying. Children don't do that. Children actually listen. And you'll be shocked to see how much you absorb when you listen. But I want to tell you, it's one of the hardest things in life to really listen. I listen. But as I'm listening, what am I doing? She's so wrong. Oh my God, she is so out for lunch. When is she going to finish so I can explain to her how clueless she or he is? In other words, I did not listen to a word you said. All I heard was my response to what you said, even before I said it. This is especially true in marriages. <laughs> in marriages, we have come to learn who our spouse is, who knows your spouse better than you. Husbands think they know their wives. Wives think they know their husbands. Sometimes they do. At least partially. And I have the person in a box. And now when you say something, I know where you're coming from. I know why you're saying it. I know who's saying it. I already know how to respond and reciprocate. And often there's a lot of fear involved in that. Can I actually be completely curious like a three-year-old? Just really listen with full curiosity. It's especially also true with children. Your child speaks to you and you feel yourself responding emotionally very intensely. The question is, do you say it? Don't you say it? How you say it? But maybe there's another option. What if I can become a child in a good way? Just to be curious and ask myself, wow, what was that intense response about? Where is that coming from? Instead of pointing the finger to the other, maybe I can actually go in and see that maybe I'm listening to it with so much static and with so much fog, fog by the, as the acronym of fear, obsessiveness, guilt, fog. And when I'm in a fog, how am I supposed to see you? How am I supposed to hear you? How are the wave, the sound wave supposed to travel? This is what Elisha ben Avuya is telling us. So very often I believe that I have acquired all the wisdom I need to know in life, and it's not easy for me to challenge my comfort zone intellectually, emotionally, psychologically, behaviorally. And that's when I become erased paper. Niyar <laughs> machok. There's so much information already contained, no real new information is going to go in unless I manage to put it into my previous paradigms. I'm not ready to shake up a serious paradigm. And there may be a good reason. I may have worked very hard to develop who I am and there's conscious or unconscious fear 
to shake up systems that I have cultivated as part of my survival skills. So every new word and idea that you want to inculcate into my mind confronts the backdrop of so many old patterns and neural pathways of old transcripts. How many transcripts am I carrying in my brain? And now you want me to challenge those transcripts? It's not easy. This is what Elisha ben Avuya is teaching us. So he says, remain a child. Especially when you're learning Torah. Haloyme Torah. Torah by definition is divine wisdom. It's transcendent. It's pure. If I'm listening to Torah through the lens of toxicity, it's going to define the message. It's erased paper. I really need to be able to be vulnerable emotionally and intellectually. Truly, truly vulnerable. And when I'm not, when I'm responding with a ferocious need to respond, that's when I have to become so curious. No agendas, no politics, no ulterior motives, even ulterior motives that seem maybe praiseworthy. I'm completely open. Now let's face it, it's scary to be open. It's scary to really be open. What are you going to tell me? If my chest and heart are completely open, I can also get hurt. And what if I already had a dagger that was put into my chest, Rahman al emotionally, or on another level, in my youth? I close up. I shut down. And if you even try to poke in that place, you become my enemy. That's why it's so important to be able to be with people who have real empathy and whom I can trust but that courage not to manipulate anything, not to black out information, to really, really be open without any bias, that's an extraordinary skill that Elisha ben Avuya teaches us. In addition to the literal teaching, he's also teaching us this profounder teaching, not about age, but about attitude, about perspective in learning, in growing. There's a fascinating medrash in Kohelas, in Ecclesiastes, Shloima Malach and uses seven times the word hevel, vanity. And the Medrash Rabbi and Kehelis says that this corresponds to seven phases in a person's life. And the Medrash says, and I quote, don't get upset at me, I'm quoting the Medrash. The Medrash says, men, or people have seven phases. We start off as kings, you start, I start off as a king, then I become a chazer, a swine. I grow into a goat, then I become a horse. Then I become a donkey, a dog, and finally I end up as a kaif, an ape. Yeah, men. We're talking about the men. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, one of my top five jokes is that there was a bar mitzvah boy who came to his mother and he said he wants to talk at the bar mitzvah about where the family comes from. You know, yichis, ancestry. So she tells him, he says, no, the beginning, where it began. Beginning? Shem created the world in six days, and then he created Adam and Chava. They had children for whatever reason. And then there was Avram and Sarah and Yitzchak and Rivka and Rachel and Leah and Yaakov. And here we are a few thousand years later. Gavaldik goes to his father. His father was a proud graduate of Columbia University. He says, Daddy, where do we come from all the way back? And Daddy says, we have evolved from the apes. And the apes, they evolved from the monkeys and the gorillas and other primates. How did it begin? began with gas and bacteria and helium, all back to the Big Bang and prebiotic soup, prebiotic chalent. Comes back to his mother, very confused. Says, Mom, I'm really confused about my bar mitzvah speech. She says, what are you confused about? He says, I want to talk about where we come from. You tell me we come from God, Adam, Eve, Abraham, Sarah. Daddy tells me we come from apes, monkeys, gorillas, chimpanzees, gas, bacteria. What am I supposed to say? Where do we come from? She looks at him and says, son, there's no contradiction. Your father was talking about his side of the family. <laughs> I'm talking about my side of the family, okay? <laughs> okay, so this is his side of the family, okay? And the Medrash explains, wh why would we insult people like this? Why would the Medrash say this? And this is what the Medrash says. Child is born, what happens? Everybody's holding the new baby. We treat him like a king or her like a queen. You take pictures. We want to know how much he weighs. Why does nobody ask me how much I weigh? Thank God. <laughs> how much he weighs, how much she weighs, the color of the eyes. Who does they look like, look like, schmuck like. We treat the mamish like a king. That's what the Medrash says. He says then once they're two years old, they're looking for every filthy place in the house to hang out in. If there's a cesspool, they're there. That's what swines do. He says at age 10, they become like goats. They're jumping everywhere. He says at age 20, they become like horses. They groom themselves 
in order to woo the opposite gender. Once you get married, now you got to start paying bills. You become a chamor, a donkey. Meshlept and schlepped and schlepped, schlepped. Meshlept here and schlepped there. He says, then he has, Baruch Hashem, a lot of children. There's tuition, there's mortgages. Now you need a chutzpah of a dog in order to be able to cover your bills and deal with all your debt. And then the medrash says, his skin, when I become old, you can kaif, you're like an ape. Asks the Kotzke Rebbe, I understand the first six. Why, when am I old, am I like an ape? So most people say, because once I'm a Zaydi or Bobby, now it's time to make tricks for the Eneklach. That's what it's time. You got to entertain them. They come. They don't want to hear your drushes. They don't want to hear they, they, Just make tricks with me. That's what some say. But look in your next source. Shem Mishmuel. Shem Mishmuel. Reb Shmuel of Sachachov. Reb Shmuel Bernstein. Quotes his father, the Avnei Nezer, who quotes his father-in-law, the Kotzke Rebbe. The Kotzke Rebbe's son-in-law was the Avnei Nezer, Reb Avram Bernstein from Sachachov in Poland. His son was Reb Shmuel. And this is what he says. Al pi masham chak avi admur zatzlala b'shem skeni zatzlala mi kotsk. Ahad amru zal hiski nasa ke koif. Hainu de ingin a koif shuhum is dame b'maisav. Apes know how to imitate amazingly. They are the mammals who know how to imitate. Ukamay shahada maisa oisa kein gamhu. You could stand in front of the ape and perform various body movements and gestures, and the ape will imitate you precisely. So what? So why when I'm old am I an ape? Listen to the Kotzke Rebbe's insight. Incredible. Kein hu ba'adam. when a person gets older, oise ke'ein masha'asa b'yoise ke'idem shehiskin. He is an ape in the sense that he imitates. You know who he imitates? Himself. I become an imitation of myself. I'm not challenging myself to reinvent myself anymore. This is who I am. I do it today because I did it yesterday, because I did it the day before. It's a security. This is what the Medrash is saying. Now sometimes that's exactly what we're looking for. We want stability. We want consistency. But there's also a profound danger. And the danger is when I'm stuck, I copy my stuckness. I don't have the ability to really be able to challenge myself. It's scary. <laughs> I become an ape. That's what the Medrash is saying. So Elisha ben Avuya says, when you're learning, remain a child. Whether you're a king or you're a goat or you're a horse, or but the spring start home, you're not copying. Don't become a copy of yourself. There's an old line, everyone is born an original. So many of us die as copies, but not sometimes as copies of others. Sometimes I become a copy of myself. When I was young, maybe I was creative. Maybe I was ready to emotionally, intellectually challenge myself, but it's time to retire. What do I retire from? I don't only retire from my job. I retire from thinking. I retire from my courage. Ripsam Chabinim of Shizcha once said, if a person loses money, Khalila, they lost nothing. Money comes, money goes. If a person's health is diminished, half of them is diminished because a person has a body and a soul. But if a mensch falirt de mut, falirt her out. Everybody knows what mut is? When you lose mut, uh, courage, spirit, stamina, vigor, you lost everything. He wasn't pro losing money and chas v'shalom losing health. Health, Beresh is Bara. He once said the first thing is Bara. But that was Gizun, Bara. But when a person loses the mut, the courage, I lose everything. I just become a copy. I copy today what I copied yesterday. This is what Elisha ben Avuya is teaching us. Now, based on this, let's go to the next step. Who are we quoting? Elisha ben Avuya. Elisha ben Avuya, sadly, as I said, had many vices. He betrayed his people. He betrayed his God. The Gemara says in Chagiga, the second chapter, dedicated a page or two, dedicated to him. He would get up from the Beis Medrash and out of his cheik, out of his bosom, would fall sifre minim. All the books of heresy would fall out of his bosom when he would come out of the Beis Medrash. He says he became addicted to Zemer Yevoni, to the Greek culture. And music, that became his new, his new religion, his new deity. The Gemara in you says he became an accomplice to the Romans. 
the Romans had Jewish slaves at the time, and they would force the slaves to keep to desecrate Shabbos. The Jews knew how to desecrate Shabbos rabbinically and not biblically. For example, when you carry, if you do only an Akira, not a Hanacha, Elisha ben Avuya would tell the Romans their religious tricks. So he became such a uh, such a uh, traitor, exactly, a boget to his people. Huh? The Gemara asks this question, what happened to him? What happened? There's so many different answers that are given. One is, the Gemara says, the Arba Nichnesul Apardis, four people went into the mystical orchard. Four people, Rabbi Akiva, Ben Azai, Ben Zoyim, and Elisha Ben Avoya. Gemara in Chagiga Daf Yudalet. Ben Azai died. Ben Zoyma hits its venivga. He lost Kavayachal his mind. Rabbi Akiva went in in peace and came out in peace. Elisha ben Avuya kitzitz ben Atias. Elisha ben Avuya plucked the plants. He became detached. They all went in and they had an incredible spiritual experience. They went into the garden of mysticism, which meaning they saw higher dimensions of reality that most people don't see. For Rabbi Akiva was incredible. For Elisha ben Avuya, it destroyed his Veltan Shaw. The Gemara also tells a story that he watched a father send his son to do the mitzvah of Shiluah Hakan, to send away the mother birds before you take the young. The Torah says, the mother, you shouldn't take the young when the mother is there. First send away the mother, and then you could take the young birds once she's gone. So the father sent his son to do it on top of a tree, send away the mother. On the way down, a snake bites him, and he dies. The two mitzvahs that the Torah promises long life for is what? Respecting mommy and tati, and Shiluah Hakan. So Elisha ben Avuya says, this is the Torah. The Gemara also says that, um, this is a crazy story. It's like a Holocaust story. Remember, he witnessed the Churban. He saw the tongue, the Romans, the Romans tortured some of the greatest sages. And he saw the tongue of one of the greatest sages, Rabbi Yehuda Hanachtaim, being eaten by a dog. Elisha ben Avuya said, this is what happens to one of the greatest sages of the time. Some say it was a chutzpah samatorgeman's tongue. And he said, I can't believe in such a God. It's like, oh, he, like he saw a holocaust. He couldn't believe anymore. The Gemara tells a story. This is all in Meseches Chagiga, in Bavli Yerushalmi. When his mother was pregnant with him, she p- passed by a place of Avoy Zara. And her, she became extremely thirsty and hungry. She smelled the food of the Avoy Zara. And she consumed it. So that had an impact. So this is even before birth. That's another story. The Gemara Osa says, we'll see at the end of the class, he heard a baskel, he heard a voice from heaven that he can't do tshuva. So he said to himself, if I anyway can't get oilam haba, at least let me have oilam haza. <laughs> if you can't enjoy the next world, at least have fun in this world. These are all different reasons that are given. Huh? Oh, we'll soon get to that. We'll soon get to that. Okay, I hear. I'm just telling you the experiences that the Gemara describes. But despite all of this, one thing he had going for him. And what was that? He absorbed Torah as a child in an incredible way. His entire youth was not just filled, it was saturated through and through with learning Torah. So notwithstanding whatever happened to him later in his life, Nobody could take this away from him. His childhood years were filled, saturated with Torah. Let's see the story in your next source. Yerushalmi Chagiga, Perik Beis Allah Ha'alaf. Talmud Yerushalmi Chagiga, chapter 2, quoted in Toysvis in Bavli Chagiga Tesvav. I quote, Avuya Abba Migdol Yerushalayim Haya. Elisha's father Abuya was one of the great of Jerusalem. B'yoyim Shabalim Mayaleini. Elisha ben Avuya is telling this to his student. Reb Meir, the day that he came to circumcise me, he called all the great Jews from Jerusalem and put them in one home. Reb Lazar and Reb Yeshua, the great sages of the time, he put in another home. 
In one home they were eating and drinking, singing, clapping their hands, dancing. While they're doing their thing and enjoying the smorgasbord on the Viennese table, a little too much, Rebbe Lezer Nebi Yeshua said, let's do our thing. Rebbe Lezer Nebi Yeshua started to learn. They started to learn Torah and then Nevi'im and then Ksuvim and a fire came down and encompassed them. You came here to burn down my house at my son's bris? We were busy learning Torah and Avim and Ksuvim. And the words were dancing. They were joyous like they were, they were given from Har Sinai. When Nebelezer and Yeshua learned Torah, it wasn't a dry intellectual experience. It was a holistic experience. It was a divine experience. The mind was on fire. The heart was on fire. They experienced Matan Torah. What happened at Matan Torah? The fire licked us, kissed us, like by Sinai. And it says the main thing that happened by Har Sinai was the fire. The mountain was on fire, burning to the heart of heaven. Because the core of Torah is not just dry information, intellectual ideas, another idea, another idea. It's fire. The fire that you're seeing is not a physical fire that's going to destroy your house. My father said, If this is the energy, if this is the power of Torah, if this child survives, child mortality was very high. If this child survives, he is dedicated to Torah. This was the commitment his father Avuya made at his bris. This is a story Elisha ben Avuya told Reb Meir years after he abandoned the faith, years after he abandoned Judaism. Okay? But this happened at the bris of Elisha. Now, because of this, because of this, even though at the end it didn't work out, Elisha ben Avuya abandoned the Torah, he left it. But in tribute to this fact, in tribute to this fact that his entire childhood from the day of his bris was completely saturated with Torah, and obviously he had the brain and the heart and the soul that was fertile. So the Mishnah pays tribute to this person in one place. And it shows to quote him, saying what? When you learn Torah as a child... It's the ink inscribed on fresh paper. It's absorbed. It's internalized. It goes into the kishkes. It goes into the gut. It goes into your physical and spiritual intestines. It becomes part of you. Because the paper is not erased. The paper is fresh. But it's saying something even more. What I learned as a child in my youngest years at Abris, it's before most of the experience and the traumas he experienced later. Remember, today and today we know this and here we see it in the Mishnah. Today in science we know that what happens to a child during pregnancy, what happens to a child during the first weeks and months and years of life is not only oh so important, it's more important than anything else. Our attachment in the first moments, weeks, months and years of our lives are the most critical. In fact, every day that passes, the attachment becomes less significant. We think, you know, when he's 12 years old, I'll educate him. But when a child who had attachment with his or her caregivers in the earliest moments, now attachment can be wounded. It could be what's called wounded attachment. But when the attachment is healthy attachment, not avoidant attachment, and not unpredictable attachment, and not attachment that's completely gone, neglected, never mind, chas v'shalem, abuse of any form, that is the most powerful Sign for the future trajectory of this child. When did Elisha ben Avuya absorb the purity of Torah, the innocence of Torah? Pre the trauma. 
Pre the churban of the Beis Hamikdash, pre the death of the Asar Rige Malchus and him seeing the tongue, pre the stories that he saw and the experiences that he saw and the whole destruction which obviously traumatized Elisha ben Avuya. This was his deeper truth pre the blockages. So we're paying tribute now to his statement. It's not just talking about other children. It's also the story about himself. Because if Elisha ben Avuya is right, it means that there's something even more powerful than everything that happened later. That's the whole Chiddush, that's the whole novelty. Even though it didn't keep him, so you would think it proves that what? That it was pretty weak, it was almost a waste, it was insignificant. So Elisha ben Avuya is telling you something not that different. And this is the one place he's quoted, saying this statement as a tribute to this truth. Oh, the Gemara says, the Gemara does say, you're right, that his father wanted the glory. It wasn't for its own sake. It wasn't for authentic purposes. And that's why it didn't last. And that's part of it. <laughs> and that itself is, but that despite all of that, despite that, including his father's intentions and what happened with his mother, etc., there was still Nayar Chadash. He absorbed this. Now you might say, but look, big deal. <laughs> It's not even true. Comes Reb Meir. Who's Reb Meir? All the sages abandoned Elisha ben Avuya after he left. The only one who didn't abandon him was Reb Meir. Reb Meir remained his student, and it was fascinating. This was a man who, first of all, he was not observant anymore. Second of all, he was a traitor. And you have to understand the trauma that it created. Imagine the greatest Jew alive. The Gadol Ador, one of the Gadol Ador, one day, not as a six-year-old, <laughs> as already a great Gadol, abandoned. You understand what happens? Just think, just think about the impact within the Jewish world. And you have to understand, it's not like everything was rosy at the time. This was right after the Churban Beis Hamikdash, which till the Holocaust was the worst calamity to befall the Jewish people. The price of a Jewish slave was less than a dollar, Josephus writes. You can buy a Jewish slave for life for less than a dollar. That's how many Jewish slaves there were. Judaism was completely decimated. The Jewish people, nobody thought there'll be a future. How could there be? With whom? With what? The top Chacham were murdered. Ultimately, Rabbi Akiva would be murdered. Now, Elisha ben Avuya did this. You can understand the impact. Reb Meir remained his student. And people criticized him. In fact, the Gemara tells a story that Elio Hanavi told one of the sages that Hashem is repeating the statements of all the Chachamim besides Reb Meir. You know why? Because look who he's learning from. And this man told Elio Hanavi, you're wrong. <laughs> why are you wrong? Take a look, next source. Chagigadav Tesvava Medbeis. He said, Reb Meir, Reb Meir found a pomegranate. He ate the insides. He threw out the klipa. He threw out the husk. A pomegranate, if you eat the shalach, the klipa, or the yellow membrane. You ever ate the yellow membrane of a pomegranate? Good, I did. It's bitter. But the seeds, geschmack, and actually good nutritious value. Today is already, it's cheap. You already sell, you could buy in evergreen, right? Pomegranate seeds. But in the good old days that were perfect, as we all know, you had to sit and collect the seeds. It could be a four-hour adventure. I know that in Eitz Yisrael. We're talking America. We're talking about the gold in the Medina. This is the country of gold, don't you know? So a Jewish comedian, Sam Levinson, once said, my father came to America. They told him the streets of the United States are paved with gold. When he came here, he discovered three things. The streets in America are not paved with gold. Number two, the streets are not paved at all. Number three, he has to pave them. But in any case, Reb Meir found the Rimoin. He ate the Toichoi. He knows what to take from Elisha ben Avoya. He took the Toichoyos. Elisha ben Avuya have, has lost the plot, but inside of him, there are priceless treasures. And what happens right after that? Hashem starts quoting the mayor. <laughs> this had to be the wisdom that came from below. In, in, in heaven, there's no dirt. You don't have to separate the toich from the klip, but there's no boirer. That's why on Shabbos, there's no boirer. But in the days of the week, 
That's the avoid the boy. You have to know what's the klipa and what's the toich. What's the toichius? Reb Meir is from the word or light. He can see the light everywhere. Chazal saying the Sefer Torah of Reb Meir didn't say kosnus or with an ayin. It said kosnus or with an aleph. Other ben Chava wore tunics not of or with an ayin, which is leather, which blocks, but or tunics of light, so he could see the light. Things were transparent for him. If this is the case, now come back to this Mishnah. What's Reb Meir saying? Al tistakil bakankan. Eliba mashayesh boy. Reb Meir wasn't only talking about the previous clause. Young people can be very, very wise, sometimes wiser than older people. He was also talking about his own teacher. He's also talking about Elisha ben Avuya. When you look at Elisha ben Avuya on the outside, bakankan. It's very, very difficult to look at him, certainly to learn from him. But I want to tell you something. When it comes to a soul, you have to be able to know how to see a neshama. Don't look at the outer vessel. What's inside it? Elisha ben Avoy absorbed Torah as a yelet and didn't just absorb it. It became part of the very fabric of his reality. So maybe even despite himself, and despite all of his blockages which he could not overcome, the truth remains that there is something unbelievably positive and good and holy inside of him, therefore I have what to learn from him, Reb Meir says. That's why Reb Meir gives exactly, exactly this metaphor, in addition to the literal interpretation, of course. Toichei achal, the Maharal says over here that Reb Meir is not arguing with Reb Yossi. Reb Yossi said, learn from olders, don't learn from young. Reb Meir says, maybe, but I'm just saying don't base it on the kankan. That's not how you base it. Base it on the person and sometimes you'll see there may be a youth who you could learn from a lot. That's how the Maharal, the Maharal explains it. The Machzer Vitri writes here that this statement from Elisha ben Avuya may have even been said after he abandoned Judaism. You could say it's a quote from the good days. He says, not necessarily. The Machzavitri says, maybe it's a quote from later, after Yatzel Atar Busra. But whoever wrote this Mishnah and organized it, he says, He took, he threw away the klipa, and he took the pnimius. Now it says in Seder Adoritus, when is the yard site of Reb Meir? Reb Meir, who remained a student, the yard site of Reb Meir is Pesach Sheni. Which is Yudalari of the 14th of year. This year it's this Friday. What's the connection? What's Pesach Sheni? Hashem told the Jews to make a Pesach in the car in Midbar in the desert the second year, the year after the Exodus. There were people who were Tame, so they could not do it. So they came to Moshe and they said, Lama Nigara, it's not fear. Why should we lose? We're Tame. So Moshe said, I gotta ask, gotta ask the boss. Hashem said, Don't worry. A second chance. Pesach Sheni. In a month, they'll do the carbon Pesach, they'll eat it. And that became a mitzvah for generations. That everyone who missed out Pesach Rishon, they were impure or they were remote, they could make Pesach Sheni. So what's the message of Pesach Sheni? Things are not lost. Things are not gone with the wind. You don't say it's over, it's over, you lost your chance. And the opportunity is gone forever. It's easy to say that. How? Look what happened. I missed it. I missed the redemption. I missed the Pesach. I was tame. And maybe he was even amazed. Maybe he was even willingly. Maybe it was my fault. But Pesach comes and says, Shtakim fafal. There's always tshuva. So Reb Meir, who holds on to the pinimius of Elisha ben Avuya, and says, this table that went into a child, everyone is saying it was a failure. And even at this class, you're telling me, Grace Gedila, look what happened. Reb Meir says, I will not stop looking at the Ur, at the Pnimius. And his yard said, it's Pesach Sheni. And now, come to the next story. What's the next story? Mm-hmm. The next story is, Yerushalmi, oh, okay, 
I have to put it into the source sheets. I'm going to read it to you. Fell out of the source sheets, but Bezer Hashem, all the source sheets are posted on the yeshiva.net. So we'll be there. But I'm going to tell you the story. Yerushalmi Maseches Chagiga. No, that we did already. That's from the bris. No, that's the let's then that's another one. It fell out. Unfortunately, it fell out. I, I by mistake I didn't put it in. It didn't fall it out. I didn't put it in. Bruria, Bruria, Hashem Nasan Hashem Lakach. Says the Yerushalmi, listen. Elisha became every person has his day. The Mishnah Gemara says Yerushalmi Chagiga Achar Yamim Chala Elisha. Elisha fell ill. So they came to Reb Meir, his student, and they said, Boyish Rabcha, your Rebbe is deteriorating. So Reb Meir said, I want to go visit him. And he went to visit Elisha ben Avuya, and he saw that he was deteriorating. So Reb Meir turned to Elisha ben Avuya and said, are you thinking about doing tshuva? Which, think about it, it's a courageous thing to say. He wasn't a 14-year-old kid. He was the greatest sage who abandoned everybody. And this is what he told them. So Elisha ben Avuya says to Reb Meir, and if I do tshuva, you think I'll be accepted? In Chazrin Miskablin? So Reb Meir said, it says in Tehillim, Toshev Enosh Ad Daka. Which means, let a human being return Ad Daka. What's Ad Daka? Ad Dichducha Shal Nefesh. Until the last vestige of life in the soul. Until the soul expires. Toshev Enosh, come back. Elisha started to cry. Ba'isasha Bache Elisha. Elisha started to sob. The Gemara says, Venifter. And he passed away. Reb Meir was overjoyed and he said these words. It seems to me that my Rebbe passed away with Tshuva. Reb Meir was overjoyed. So Reb Meir could look and say, Al testakel bakan kan. Don't look at the bottle. Even though the bottle is so powerful. And the bottle, unfortunately, has gotten to some people. The bottle has the bottle. I should add, this is in Yerushalmi Chagiga. In the Babylonian Talmud, in Chagiga, there's a different story. And that is that when Elisha ben Avuya died... They didn't want to take him into Gan Eden because of his sins. They didn't want to take him into Gehenna because of his Torah. So the mayor said, it's not good. Let him be judged and cleansed and come to Elam Haba. And when the mayor died, they saw smoke coming out of the grave of Elisha ben Avuya. Rabbi Yochanan said, how long is that going to happen? It's embarrassing for his Rebbe. When Rabbi Yochanan passed away, the smoke stopped. Elisha ben Avuya was in Olam Haba. According to the Yerushalmi, he did shuva in his lifetime. According to the Bavli, he was cleansed afterwards. But Rabbi Meir said this person can ultimately be cleansed and healed. What's the idea? All what Elisha ben Avuya said. The paper was fresh. There's a truth that's inherited in the fabric of this child that can't be erased. It can't be eliminated. So even such a genius, and even a person who became such a Russia, Elisha ben Ayavuya says, Loi yeled, understand the impact. And that's why he's quoted here, because on this level, he belongs in the Mishnayas. For this teaching, he belongs in the Mishnayas. Because what's this teaching saying? That what I learned then is more powerful than anything else. And one day, it will emerge in one form or another. Here we come to the Arizal, who now teaches us yet something even deeper. Take a look in this Pasuk in Parshish Kisisa. Everybody knows you'd give them a this the 13 attributes of compassion. Hashem, Hashem, Kel, Rachem, Vachan, and Erech, Apayim, Rav, Chesed, Vemes, Noitzel, Chesed, Alavim, Noitzel, Yavim, Vafesha, Vachata, 
V'nake lo yenake. English, Hashem preserves loving kindness for thousands of generations. He forgives iniquity. He forgives rebellion. He forgives sin. V'nake lo yenake. Yet cleanse, He does not completely cleanse of sin. What does this mean? Cleanse, He does not completely cleanse. What does it sound like? It sounds like He'll forgive, He'll atone, but ultimately... The filth I can't completely eliminate. You know, the wedding gown, the oil is saturated. I can give it away to the best dry cleaners in Muncie and in Manhattan. They'll take out the stain. Most people won't see it. But those who are experts see it. We all know. Nake lo yinake. Ultimately, cleansing won't be completely cleansed. That's what the Pasuk says. And that's how Rashi quotes it. Then Rashi quotes it. The Gemara says in Yuma... That nake is talking about l'shavim, those who do tshuva. Lo yinake for those who don't do tshuva. For those who repent, he cleanses. For those who don't, he doesn't cleanse. But the literal interpretation is nake lo yinake. Comes Darizal and says, take a look at the words v'nake lo yinake. I'm going to read Darizal. It's going to be very mystical. But don't shut down on me because you'll get it. It just has to be explained. Likute ashas lo arizal. Hakosov Oimer Nake lo yenake. Viesh bem remes shame havaya. Bemilas venake yesh vovke. Bemilas yenake yesh yutke. Mi pashton shaldvarim mashma shafilu le shovim enoi moichel. Loze omar shaal yestakel bekankan ele bemashe yesh boy. The hainu shame havaya haromus beroshe tevis, the safe tevis, the oil ma, shahu amakabul shovim. Let me explain. Take a look at the words venake lo yenake. You see? The first word, venake, has two letters inside. What are they? Nun and kuf. The second word, yenake, what are the middle letters? Nun and kuf. What do nun and kuf twice make up? Which word? Kan kan. What's kan kan? The bottle, the vessel, the container. That's kuf nun, kuf nun, right? Kan, kan. Kuf nun, kuf nun. Now, but Venake has a letter in the beginning and a letter at the end. What's the letter in the beginning? Vav. What's the letter at the end? Hey. Yinake has a letter in the beginning and a letter in the end. Yud and Hey. So in these two words you have Hashem's name. Yud and Hey, Vav and Hey. Right? The beginning and the end of Venake is Vav and Hey. The beginning and end of Yinake is Yud and Hey. In the beginning you have Kankan. Now, now. Go to the next paragraph. Let's do Yud, Hey, and Vav, and Hey, and spell it out fully. On the left, you, I'm spelling it out fully. Yud is 10. We're writing out Hashem's name, right? Vav and Hey, Yud and Hey is Hashem's name. If we want to write out the letters fully, Yud, Yud, how do you spell Yud, a full Yud? Yud, Vav, Dalid. Hey, Hey, Aleph. Vav, Vav, Aleph, Vav. Hey, Hey, Aleph. Let's now do the numerical value. Follow. Yud, on the left side you have the numerical value. Yud is 10. Vav is 6. Dalit is 4. He is 5. Aleph is 1. Vav is 6. Aleph is 1. Vav is 6. He is 5. Aleph is 1. Let's bring this together. 10, 6, and 4 is how much? 20. Another 5 and 1 is 6, is 26. Another 6 and 1 is 7. How much is 26 and 7? 33. Another 6 and 5 is 44. The last one is 45. 45 makes up the word ma. Ma. Says Darizal, everybody's with me? Yud hey vav hey when it's spelled out makes up forty five. Yud vav dalid hey aleph vav aleph vav aleph. If you don't understand, ask because this you have to understand. Yud hey vav hey makes forty five, which is mem hey ma. Says Darizal al tistakil bakankan elo bema sheyesh boy. When you're reading the words v'nake lo yinake. You can get caught up in saying, you see, God doesn't cleanse. V'nake lo yinake. Some things, just, he can't cleanse it. Too much. Al tistakel bakankan. 
Don't look at the kan kan. Don't look at nun kuf nun kuf. Ela b'masha yesh boy. Can you identify the forty-five that's there? The vav and hey in v'nake, the yud and hey and yinake. Why? Shahu hamekabel shavim. Because when you look at the kan kan at one level, you say it's impossible. There's too much brokenness in me. I'm lost. I'm confused. I'm overwhelmed. It's been 40, 50, 60 years of anxiety, of brokenness. I made so many mistakes. Or I look at another person and I say, there's no healing here. V'nake lo yinake. And even with all the treatments and even with all the help, okay, so we'll be a little better, but we all know ultimately v'nake lo yinake. It's not like fresh paper. Comes Elisha ben Avuya and says, you have to know that every child in the womb of its mother learned kol ha kula. So the deepest information that's embedded in the DNA of a child is taira, is truth, is authenticity. So if you look at the kankan, you could say v'nake lo yinake. And you know what? With those glasses, you're even right. <laughs> the instruments I use to define reality will define reality. Everybody knows that. A red cup, the water looks red. If I have tinted glasses, I see things in a certain way. All light is based on the frequencies of the electromagnetic field that your retina and brain can observe and interpret. But he says, Al tistakil bakankan. Can you see the ma? And ma is the gematria adam. Aleph, dalad mem is 45. Because a person, Hashem creates a person, he says, nasa adam. The word Adam means Adama, earth. But the Shalos says the word Adam comes from the word Doime, Adame Le'elyon. A person is a mirror of the divine, Adame. Like you say Doime, Adame Le'elyon. I am a metaphor for the Elyon. I am a mirror of the divine. That's Adam. Adame Le'elyon. When Reb Meir saw Elisha ben Avuya died sobbing, he said Doime. We also use the word daimah. Daimah doesn't only mean, I think. Elisha ben Avuya reached the ma. The Adam. The ma sheyesh boy. Adam is ma. Mem he. So Rabbi Ahmeya says, you see that I never looked at the kankan. I saw the kankan. I saw that the kankan didn't, didn't uh, herald good news. I saw that the kankan was a turnoff. I knew the challenges of the kankan. But I never lost focus of the ma, the yudke vofke, that's embedded in the core of the soul, which infinitely transcends any form of brokenness, any form of dysfunction, even any sin, transgression, mistake that I ever made, even if due to my circumstances and horrible choices, they were even malicious. That's how powerful truth is. And then he adds one more thing, that Arizal. Don't shut down on me. Kufnun is 150, right? Kufnun is 150. Kufnun again is 150, 300. That makes up the word matzpates. You see the next line. Matzpates. Mem is 40. Tzadik is 90. Pei is 80. Tzadik is 90. 90 and 90 is 180. Plus another 80 is 260. Plus Mem, 260 and 40 is 300. Now, the Zoyar says something fascinating. In the Hebrew language, every letter is an energy. We substitute letters in a system called At-Bash. At-Bash means the first letter of the alphabet is connected to the last. Aleph and Tuf. The second with the second to the last. Beis and Shin. The third with the third of the last. Gimel and Resh. Dalet goes to Kuf. Okay? Where does He go? Tzadik. Where does Vav go? Pay. That's called the system of Adbash. Zion connects with Ayin. Ches connects with Samach. Tes. You understand the system? Atbash. Says the Zoyar, when you want to do Hashem's name, Yud and He and Vav and He and Adbash, what are the letters? So take a look. The Yud becomes the Mem. The He becomes the Tzadik. Vav becomes Fei. He becomes Tzadik. That's Mat Spates. 
that's 300. Says Darizal Al Tistakel Bakankan. Ella Bemasha Yeshboy. Don't only look at the Kankan, the 300 from Kankan, Bemasha Yeshboy. It's a at bash of Yutke Vovke. The Yutke Vovke is concealed in the Kankan itself. This is even deeper. It's not just the Yud and the hay on the outskirts, on the outside, on the periphery, the Makif. The Kankan itself is an atbash of Yudke Vovke. This is even a deeper idea that even every distortion in a person's mind, if you trace it back to the beginning, you will find innocence. That's what the Kabbalists write. Rabbi Abu Lefri, Rabbi Chaim Abu Lefri writes, Yudke Vovke is Yetzer Hatoiv v'yetzer Hara. What does that mean? How could that be? The answer is, as the Mishnah says, b'cholovavcha b'shnei yitzaracha. If you take back the Yitzhahara, the Kankan, back to its source, you will see that there was an innocence there that ultimately got distorted. Even with Elisha ben Avuya, what turned them off more than anything else? The pain of the Jewish people. He couldn't forgive God for the pain of the Jewish people. What do you see in this? You see in this, not just a rebel, a degenerate, a sick man, a perverted, abominable, grotesque human being. He saw the tongue of one of his gay and he couldn't deal with it. He saw this kid being bitten and it broke him, it destroyed him. He saw the churban beis amigdash and it he lost it. He saw, he saw a lot. And he didn't have the kalim, the containers to deal with it. The kankan became ruined. The keli became ruined. But deep down in the keli, the Rizal says it's matzpitz, which is the adbash of Shem Avai. What's adbash? The first letter ends up the last. The person who was supposed to be first ends up all the way at the end. So you say, oh, he's the loser. You know why he ended up last? Because he was first. You'll see it sometimes in classrooms, this. You'll see it in families. The family crucible, the most sensitive child, becomes the most broken child. They point him and say, oh, he's embarrassing the family. He's actually the most normal one who couldn't deal with the lies. Boom, he exploded. He didn't keep it together. The Aleph became the tough. So if you look Bechitzainius externally, ha, huh, tough. You're the last one in the race. Last one. You couldn't even come in second. You don't even get on your report card good midas. You know those report cards? I once heard from Dr. David Pelkowitz. In camp, they give you prizes, you know, baseball, football, soccer, this. He wasn't good, so he didn't get anything. Not at Mishnah's Balpeh and not sports garnished. But they have to give the child something. So they wrote, he has good midas. He said he was so embarrassed he didn't even want to show it to his parents because good midas, you know, it's like he's a good person, thank you. But his mother and father found it in the suitcase. And he said, I heard this from Dr. David Palkowitz, he's a psychologist at YU, professor of psychology at YU. And he told me his father and mother looked at it and they called him over and they said, you should know that for us, this counts more than anything else. The wonderful human being that you are. And he says it changed everything for him. In the power of perspective. Is it a tough or is it an aleph? At bash. The kankan is kaf kankan. It's the outer kankan. In at bash, it's yud ke vof ke. This is what Arizal is teaching. That's the last piece. That's the last piece. This is the end. This is the end. Very good. Mamish the end. Now, this is not, this is not sugarcoating horrific behavior. Of course not. There's a reason they call them Acher. It's explaining why one Mishnah chose to quote him. And what? This statement, which puts him right into the Mishnayas, because it tells us about the essence behind all of the immorality and behind all of the spiritual uncleanliness. This teaching of Elisha ben Avuya is what rescues him and brings him to the Mishnayas. And it's why Reb Meir, at his last moments, will say, of course you can do tshuva. There's cleansing, there's no question, there's always cleansing. Tshuva I have to do. Tshuva I have to do. 
Even if I slam my finger on somebody by mistake, <laughs> right? And I chas v'shalom break your finger, there's pain and I have to apologize and I have to make amends. Even if it was a mistake, certainly if it wasn't a mistake. We sometimes hurt people because of our brokenness and taking responsibility is not about blame or judgment. It's being a person. It's saying, yes, I was blocked. I was stupid. I was hurt. But sometimes hurt people can hurt people. And when I become healthy, what's the first sign that I'm healthy? I can take responsibility. I can take, that's the first sign I can take responsibility. Yes, maybe somebody else really did something that derailed me. But now that I know it, I want to take responsibility. That means I'm not a victim anymore. I'm taking responsibility. What happened, happened. Where is the road ahead? I want to take responsibility. That's what tshuva means. Tshuva means you have dignity. You have agency. Sometimes it's easier said than done because of the profound pain. You wanted to say something, somebody? Yeah? Gemini. Sivan is Gemini, twins. So it does say that the reason Torah was given in Sivan is this idea of Toomim, twins, yeah. What is Matzpetz? The word Matzpetz is a term that's used in Zoyer and in Kabbalah often to describe Hashem's name in Atbash. It probably has a meaning as well. I'm not sure. The Rizal has a meaning for it. But it's in Kabbalah, it's used Matzpetz as Hashem's name. Because remember, Yudke Vofke is Mem, Tzadik, Fei Tzadik, and Atbash. And that's the Gematria of Kanka. It could be. It could be. It could be. I have to research what the origin of Matzpetz is, why they use that word. I don't know. I don't know. Now, I want to do one last thing with you and bring it together. Be'ezer Hashem. I also want to add, I told you that in this Mishnah, it says Reb Meir, but in many versions it says Rebbe. Rebbe speaks about the bottle, not Reb Meir. There's two versions. Arizal has Reb Meir, others say Rebbe. The Yerushalmi Chagiga says that the Elisha ben Avuya left daughters. There were daughters who survived. They didn't have any money. They were poverty stricken. Elisha ben Avuya was supported by the Romans. So he had luxury. He had servants. The Romans loved him. But his daughters, they wanted to be Jewish. So you can understand they weren't very popular, unfortunately. Because people were traumatized by their father. So they went collecting for Daka. And uh, the Yerushalmi says, the Romans didn't like them because they wanted to be Jewish. They defected. And the Jews had a hard time. You know how people are. Unfortunately, they're not responsible, but you know, people's psychology doesn't always follow justice. We stereotype. They came to Rebbe, Rabbi Huda Nasi. And Rebbe was surprised. Rebbe said, the Pasik says in Tehillim, Ali Hiloi Moshe Chesed Val Somebody who was such a traitor, I wouldn't think this person could live a leg could leave a legacy. So the girls looked at the daughters, looked at Rabbi Yudah Nasi, and they said, Rebbe, Al Tabeid Bemaisav, Habeid Bitoirasai. Don't look at our father's actions, look at his Torah. Rebbe started to sob. And he said, from now on, all these daughters will be supported fully from us. And Rebbe said, Elisha ben Avoya toiled in Torah, and it wasn't always L'Shem Shemayim. And look at what type of children he had. Imagine somebody who's immersed in Torah L'Shem Shemayim. So even Rebbe came around and he said, Look at the children Elisha ben Avoya had. So that's why it fits with the version of Rebbe said it. On the other hand, in the Bavli, we learn that Reb Meir says, throw away the klipa. And Reb Meir, it says that Reb Meir threw away the klipa and he took the pnimius. And Reb Meir has a few statements where he speaks about how Elisha ben Avuya's Torah is ultimately what put him in an extraordinary spiritual status despite everything, to the point that the Gemara quotes Rava, who says, and Chagiga says, a Talmud Chacham is compared in Shir Hashirim to an egois, to a walnut. Why? If a walnut falls into excrement, the nut does not become disgusting. What do you do? You crack the shell, 
You take a nutcracker, you remember Pesach? You remember Pesach, the only food you can eat? Walnuts? You forgot, huh? Okay. You crack it. If a grape has excrement, it's bad news. Even pistachios or other nuts. But an egg is the clipper so thick. You crack it and you have a beautiful geshmaka walnut. So he said, Talmud Chacham Shesarach ain't toirosoy nim esas. Even if the walnut became filled with excrement, the nut is never discussed. The Gemara says in Chagiga. So this is the Altistakel Bekankan Elaba Mashayashboy. And now we come to the final piece. Take a look at your last source. Says the Gemara in Chagiga Tatsbava Madal of Tanur Rabban, and the rabbis taught. Acher was horseback riding on Shabbos. And Reb Meir was running behind him to learn Torah. Imagine the scene. It's Shabbos. Elisha ben Avuya is horseback riding. Okay? He's in the, the park on a mountain on a slope. And but he's, he's teaching. And Reb Meir, the greatest sage, is running after me once a year. Oh my Lord, at some point he says, Mayor, Chazor Lacharecha. Mayor, go back. Shekvar Shiarti Beikve Susi Atkan Kum Shabbos. I was counting the footsteps of my horse. We just reached Kum Shabbos. You're not going to go further. They left the city. After the city, there's 2,000 Amas, 3, 4,000 feet. I imagine he's giving a shear. He's horseback riding and he's counting the steps of his horse. You think you know how to multitask? He told Mayor, go back. I'm the sinner. You're not. You're not allowed to walk any further. Omar Lai, the mayor says, Af Atachazar Bach. He does a he does a spin on the words. You also come back. He doesn't mean only come back geographically. It means come back existentially. Omar Lai, he says, I told you. I heard from behind the heavenly curtain. Children who are astray come back except for Acher. I heard a heavenly message that everyone is welcome. Shuvu Bonim Shavavim. It's a verse in Yecheskel. We say it in the Ne'il of Yom Kippur. Shuvu Bonim. Come back. Besides Acher, I can't go back. And here I ask you the greatest question. We have a principle in Judaism. Why would God say that you can't come back? Do tshuva. The Rambam says in Hilchus tshuva, even Menashe, the most heinous king of the Jewish people, Menashe, did tshuva and was accepted. The Rambam says, Kofar bi'ikr kol yom, if you could deny Hashem your whole life, at the end the person does tshuva, and the repentance is fully accepted. And here he hears a voice, Chutz Me'acher. It's one of the most difficult questions. What happened? God, don't you want Elisha ben Avuya to do tshuva? Everyone besides him? Menashe was worse than Elisha ben Avuya. The Gemara says in Yavam, Mamdes, Menashe killed his grandfather. You know who his grandfather was? Yeshaya Hanavi. Imagine you kill your own Zayd, and you know who your Zayd is. Yeshaya Hanavi. This was Menashe. There was no murderer like him. There was no idolater like him. And he did tshuva. It wasn't an easy tshuva. Malachim didn't want to accept him. That's a whole story in Masech Sanhedrin, but he did. The same story is in one more source. Talmud Yerushalmi Chagiga Perek Beis with one little change. Now you'll see. What happens is the Yerushalmi says it's Shabbos afternoon. Reb Meir is giving a shir. Shabbos afternoon, you learn. He's in the middle of the drasha. You can imagine there were hundreds of Jews, or thousands of Jews, whoever was there. Somebody came over to him. And said, your teacher is on a horse outside of the shul. Now what do you do if you're in the middle of a shir and you have thousands of people? You'll say, I'll come see him tomorrow, tell him, uh, good Shabbos, right? The Gemara says, Reb Meir left. He left the shul. I assume he apologized. I gotta go. And he went to Elisha ben Avuya, who was on a horse. And he started to follow him. This is how the story happened. Reb Meir left his shir and he followed him. And what happened is he told him, you can't go further because it's Tchum Shabbos. This is how the Yerushalmi tells the story. 
So Meir told Elisha ben Avuyah, You have so much wisdom. How could you not do tshuva? I don't understand. You get it. Elisha ben Avuyah, you're not a bum. You're not a shite. You get it. I know you. You have to understand these were not only brilliant people. You're talking about people who were spiritually unbelievably sensitive. What's happening? Amar le lesa noyachel. I can't. Amar le lama. Why? Amar le. Pama yisi yoyv lefnei beis kodesh hakadoshim rachav al susi biyem akipurim shechaliyas b'shabbos. I was once horseback riding on Yom Kippur, which was on Shabbos. We're in front of the Holy of Holies. Understand what's happening. The Beis Hamikdash is destroyed. The Harabayas is flattened. Or it's a slope. It's Yom Kippur and Shabbos. Elisha ben Avuya decides, what's, what should a good Jewish boy do Yom Kippur and Shabbos? What's the best activity? Horseback riding. Where? In Montana? No. In Kentucky? No. In Rockland County? No. Where? In the place where the Kodesh HaKadoshim was, the Harabayas. It's a great mountain, great slopes. It's the place to go horseback riding, Yom Kippur, Shechaliyaz, B'Shabbos. Who? The Gadol Hadar. Or the former Gadol Hadar. V'shamati baskel yotza mebeis Kodesh HaKadoshim. I heard a voice that came out from the house where the Holy of Holies used to be. V'aymeres. Very good. Very good. Very good. V'aymeres. And the voice said... Shuvu banim shayvavim, chutz me Elisha ben Avuya. Children who went astray return beside Elisha ben Avuya, shayada kaychi umarad bi. Because he knew, he knows the truth. And his behavior is painful. He knows, he knows who I am, umarad bi. So now let's think about this. The Baskal says no tshuva for him. How can that be? It's on Yom Kippur Shecheli is B'Shabbos and he hears a Basco. I don't go horseback riding on Yom Kippur. I never heard a Basco on Yom Kippur. I do hear a Basco. I'm hungry. I have to say the truth. I do hear a Basco. I'm thirsty. I do hear a Basco. This chazan I love. <laughs> or sometimes could be a little better. But I still love him. I hear a lot of baskals. He's hearing a baskal from the Rebbeinu Shalom. What is going on here? Rabbi Yosef Mitrani, the Marit, the Shalad, the Reishis Chachm, all say the Gemara says in Psachim Kol Mashabalabais Oymel Chasei Chutz Mitzay. Whatever the owner of a house tells you to do, you have to do. Besides, leave. So they say when Hashem said leave, you didn't have to listen. <laughs> if I'm the host, I say please take off your shoes. You take off the shoes. But if I tell you leave, you don't have to listen. So Hashem is the boss. Whatever he says, listen. If he says get out, sorry, I'm not leaving. That's how they explain why Elisha ben Avuya didn't have to listen to the baskel. But why did he even have a baskel? Reb Tzadik HaKoyen of Lublin writes in Takana Sashavin, he wasn't planning to do tshuva. Why did God say I'm not accepting you? He wasn't interested. It's like I don't go over to you and say, by the way, you're not invited to my house Friday night. <laughs> you weren't planning to come. By the way, Elisha ben Avuya, I'm not interested in you. I'm not interested in you. It's a mutual feeling. Wonderful. What, what's this baskel even about? It's not like he wanted to do tshuva, he went to shul. Oh, so let's think for a moment. Altistakel bakan kan. If you want to desecrate Yom Kippur, where do you do it? Go home. Go home. I don't know, go travel somewhere. You want to go horseback riding? Go to Banff. Go to the Colorado Rockies. This is your place to go. What does this demonstrate? This demonstrates the depth of a relationship. The depth of hatred demonstrates the depth of disappointment. The depth of betrayal. We all know that. The depth of hurt. I hate you. Of course. Of course. Of course. In children in orphanages, in orphanages and foster homes will never tell their caregivers, I hate you. You know why? 
They're afraid. You could tell mommy, I hate you. You're the worst mommy who ever existed. You know that, right? You're the worst. But that's even as a little kid, even when there's real, real disappointment. It's because there was so much connection, there was so much opportunity. A stranger can't stab me in the core of my soul. May be able to hurt me. But the way we can affect somebody who's so close is much deeper because of the level of manipulation and exploitation of their brain. Because I don't know, do I love you or do I hate you? I love you, so how can this happen? That's why Rahman al when horrible things happen in a family from close people in the family, it's the worst form of murder because they can't even trust themselves. Because it couldn't be, especially if the person is respected in the community. Now, Elisha ben Avuyah's Yom Kippur Shechali is Bashab is going to the Harabayas. Something is drawing him there. And he hears a baskel. What does it mean he hears a baskel? It's a voice inside. But do you see the way the baskel is recorded in the first text and in the second text? There's one difference. In the first text it said, the baskel said, Shuvu banim shayvavim chutz me'acher. In the second text it says, Shuvu banim shayvavim chutz me'alisha ben Avuyah, his name. Which one was it? That's the key to the story. In Talmud Bavli it says Chutz Meyacher. In Talmud Yerushalmi it says Chutz Me'alisha Ben Avuya. The Baskel said Shuvu Banim Shayvavim Chutz Meyacher. What he heard was Shuvu Banim Shayvavim Chutz Me'alisha Ben Avuya. The voice told him, "Come back! You're my child." You're not an Acher. You're not an alien. You're not a foreigner. You're not damaged. You're not lost. You're not a cancerous tumor who fell into my domain. You're my child. I love you infinitely, absolutely, unconditionally like a child. But one day, you developed an image of yourself and you started to see yourself as an Acher. When this woman looked at you and said, you, Elisha ben Avuya, you plucked out grass and she said, oh, you're somebody else. And you internalized that new name. You became somebody who is not you. You look in the mirror and you see yourself based on the dibuk that went into you. Not based on you. But today, in Kippur, I want to tell you, you're my child. Take your acher, leave your acher by the door. Leave it chutz, leave it outside, and come in as a child. Emotionally and psychologically, I may develop a whole perception about myself, which is acher, it's not me. It's somebody else's dirt and filth and poison and toxicity that has infiltrated into my system and I don't recognize myself and the more I see in the mirror another person, it's an acher. So the Rabbi Nishleilam says, but you're my child. Banim atem, shuvu banim shevavim, chutz me acher, let go of the acher. What Elisha ben Avuya heard was, chutz me Elisha ben Avuya. I sometimes internalize the acher so profoundly, that's my name. I don't have another name. That's Elisha ben Avuya. I sabotage myself because my very brain that hears the voice is operating from a place of brokenness and trauma and therefore can't even hear or relate to the Ben because on an emotional, energetic level, maybe on a nervous system level, I'm an Acher. I'm an alien and words, words won't cut it. So he tells Reb Meir, you got the wrong person. I can't do it. But Reb Meir knows the truth. I know the truth about Elisha ben Avuya. I know he's not an Acher. He thinks he's an Acher. So when he's sick, he goes to Elisha ben Avuya. And he says, now Elisha ben Avuya says, I can't. And Reb Meir says, Toshev ener shadaka. At that point, Elisha's blockages break. There is that point where my blockages are removed. And how do we know it? Elisha just starts sobbing. He doesn't talk. And that level, there's nothing to say. It's not an argument. It's not a counter-argument. He just knows who he is. It's that moment in life when you're given the gift of knowing who you are. It's not intellectual. It's not a conversation. It's not a dialogue. It's not a proof. It's not a refutation. It's just the tears of Elisha ben Avuya where he opens himself up to his raw 
innocence of the loyme Torah yelled of the child who absorbed so much Torah. And he passes away with that peace. And Reb Meir says he just went back to that moment. Doyma shemitoich tshuva, nifter Rebbe. And that's why Reb Meir's own yard site becomes on Pesach Sheni, which represents this truth that Acher is an external definition, even if it infiltrated so deep. And the truth is, you are always and forever my beloved child. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. <laughs> Next week, Lagba, next week, Lagba Eimer, there's no class, okay? Next Tuesday, there's no class. We will resume the next week. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.